Hey guys, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Hope you are doing well. Today, or this week, we have Edwin Cox from West Music Group. It's a production company based in many countries, 42 countries around the world with production studios and offices. It's a great episode if you're interested in making a living or doing anything that has to do with um, live music or sync music, uh, being a publisher, being a composer, and all that. Um, Edwin is currently based in Los Angeles. They have offices here in London. Um, that's where they started. Uh, but he's now over in LA where they have set up their new office and production studios, etc. In this conversation with Edwin, we, we spoke about him starting out as a sound engineer and how he eventually got into the whole library music business. The early struggles he encountered um, with West, West One Music and the, struggle of, the struggles of getting your music onto the shelves of the broadcasters, so to speak, before there was, there was files, before the whole industry was based on files, I guess, when you actually had to have your music on the CD, on the shelf, on, on the broadcasters. Something I never thought about, but obviously that's, that's how it worked. We talked about networking, and um, also something I've been thinking about recently is if you skip, if you use the skip intro tr intro function on Netflix and Amazon Prime, if that affects the royalties composers and publisher gets nowadays. The best way to pitch your music if you're a composer and the best way to pitch that to publishers like West One Music Group. How to get your foot in the door. How they as a publisher pitch to projects and how they try to get jobs uh, from projects that are happening. The pain of pitching and waiting and the constant pitching you have to do and the, the time you have to wait for to get a meeting or for projects to come around and all those sort of things we all experience as composers or if you are a publisher too. And the benefits of uh, lifetime contracts and why that's beneficial for you and the publishers and I think you're gonna love this conversation with Edwin and I think you're gonna take away a lot and if you're into the composing part of the music industry, having your own publishing company, I think you find it's very useful and valuable. Uh, before we get into the conversation with Edwin, I want to tell you about a free guide you can download straight away. It's in the link below. Um, if you're a home studio owner, a freelance sound engineer, and you want to increase your client base, get more clients, um, this guide is for you. You can learn how to reach out to bands online, how to build profitable relationships with people in the music industry, um, how to get your foot in the door if you just graduated from college or university. Um, this guide is for you, it's free. Just enter your email address, download it, use the tips in it, and I'm sure you're gonna see results. But now, over to Edwin. Well, so first of all, Edwin, Thanks for coming on. It's awesome to have you here, pleasure. finally. Yes, um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Cool. Um, so before we get into the whole uh, West One music group and all the fun stuff about library music, sync music, um, I'd love to know, because I know you started out as a sound engineer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so my journey, um, I guess it's, yeah, I just described it to someone the other day. So it's, yeah, it's basically from the studio to the office. Mm -hmm. um, so the beginnings for me was really about music um, from a creative standpoint and the making of music. You know, so but going back to sort of very early, early years, it was all about, you know, DJing for me, um, mixing, recording, copying tapes, messing around with audio, messing around with sampling. Um, and that side of things. And I, I, I first got a job in a studio, uh, post, a bit, I guess a small production studio doing pop music hmm. in London. So we worked on um, commercial pop records. And my first job was, you know, as, as it always is in those, those situations, was making tea. Right. So I, I was this sort of tea boy for a while um, with a production company or team of producers called Rosen Foster. Mm -hmm. And they, they produced music for a number of different bands at the time. So stuff like E17, um, with, we did the single with Gabrielle, which I think got to number two. So that was quite good. And um, we did stuff with Roachford. I think that was 
uh, did quite well, actually, if you remember Roachford from back in the day. No, I don't, unfortunately. And so, um, Eagle Eye Cherry. Ah, cool. About yeah, yeah. Talk about Swedish. Yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so we did a number of different pop things. And uh, as I say, I started off making tea and then it sort of evolved from there. And towards the end of my time with, with those two producers, I was much more involved in the engineering and the recording side of it. Hmm. So my, my background to all of that I'm doing now is very much about the music, um, music first kind of mentality. And I think that's, that's true of anything that we're doing now. It's really, I think what helps us stand out is the content itself. Um, and obviously that's a very important part of being in the music business is the music itself. But, you know, you do sometimes lose track of that. So you do have to bring that back sometimes and go like, yeah. <laughs> you know, if the music's good, it will find a home mm -hmm. concept. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and that, that was a big thing in the early days of West One as well. It was really about, um, you know, when we started West One, everyone was saying, oh, it's too late, the market's too saturated, there's too many people doing this, wow. and um, you will never get a space on that shelf. And there was always this mystical concept in the early days of West One around getting your CDs on the shelf of a TV company. Right. And, you know, we, we wanted people to reserve a space for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so that's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. So, but did you say they use CDs back? Obviously, they did. They just never entered my mind that there would be huge libraries of CDs, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we talk about that here quite a lot as well because you sort of forget now we're in this digital space. Yeah. It was actually really simple. What we used to do was make albums, make CDs, and we had a warehouse. We did the manufacturing in Austria, wow. uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and Austria and Switzerland, sorry. And um, yeah, we used to manufacture these CDs, put them in the warehouse, and then we'd send them out to our clients, uh, not just in the UK, but also around the world. Right. So if you, it's a much simpler process than it is today, because now I think our music goes to about 500 different destinations. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, and it all happens digitally. Yeah, exactly. And every week there's another destination, you know, be it a company that does audio fingerprinting or whether it's a TV network that uses a different platform, which could be, you know, stuff like I Like Music in the UK with BBC, or it could be NetMix, or it could be Source Audio, or it could be SoundMiner. Hmm. So there's just hundreds of these platforms that are popping up, you know, yeah. almost, almost weekly. But so what's the audio fingerprinting? I never heard about that before, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, what we do in within West One, I think a lot of companies now do it, is that we actually fingerprint the audio. And that every single piece of music that we put out is fingerprinted. And then we use different services to monitor for those fingerprints. Wow. So we're monitoring to both TV and radio around the world to find out where our music is being placed. Hmm. And that, that often helps us not just from a understanding from a sales perspective as of where the music is getting used, but it also allows us to make claims against the collecting societies. Right. Just, okay, we got this. You know, we got a statement from you, um, and uh, it doesn't match with what we're seeing like, actually on television itself. So it gives us that hard evidence to then go back to the society and make a claim on our behalf and on our composer's behalf as well. Right. Yeah. That's that's that sounds very. Good, actually. <laughs> I just never heard about it. <laughs> yeah, you just sort of wish, sometimes wish that the societies would use it better themselves rather than us having to invest in it and then deploy it. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly, man. But so how, how did you make the transition from being a sound engineer to working, maybe not straight to West One, because you worked at PRS too, right? So how, yeah, did, how did that transition first, happen? Yeah, so my first transition into the sort of office, I guess call it office environment and publishing was for a company called Boozy and Hawks. Mm -hmm. So Boozy and Hawks, is, as you may know, is a classical, traditionally a classical music publisher. Mm. They had a small media division. So they were producing music within the media division, but they also had this publishing, you know, the, the core of the business was really music publishing. So that, that was the first time, the first job that I had where the creation and sound recording of music came together with the publishing and the IP. And that was really the sort of first time that those two worlds connected for me. And really the, the, the PRS side just came much later on. 
Um, so once I'd sort of, we'd established West One and we had a foothold in the market, um, what we discovered is that we were very much as a small independent on the receiving end of decisions that are made at a much higher level within the society networks. So really, the, you know, the idea around again, contributing to the PRS world was really around how do we get a voice, not just for ourselves, but also for, for the media and independent publisher and writer business overall. Hmm. So really, it was about that, you know, how do we contribute to that community? How do we get that voice heard? Because we felt certainly that the media side of music publishing wasn't really being recognized or, or being like as respected as we wanted it to be within the society network. Right, let's see. But I guess that, that was the driver for that. Hmm. We, but that, that came after obviously quite a few years of, of doing West One and establishing West One. <clears throat> particularly in the UK and obviously West One developing that reputation and um, that credibility, I guess. Right. But did you start West One 2002? Is that correct? Yeah, so 2002 uh, was day one. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we started in about sort of August time 2002. And the first albums we released in, I think it was about March, March, April time in 2003. Hmm. And we started with a launch pack of five albums on CD in a box set, which I still have here, actually. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so how did you go about then pitching your music? Because, you know, there's not like you can email tons of labels. You know, it was the old school days, right? So yeah, old school days. So again, I guess it's still kind of hopefully how the UK still works to an extent. It was really about getting out and seeing people and building relationships hmm. and, you know, and trying to, as I said before, try and get that space on the shelf. You know, how, how do you get a TV company to sort of reserve you the spot? I mean, it's different now because you want people to go to your website hmm. or to like look you up within their aggregated system. But, um, but ultimately it was about, you know, building good relationships um, and having a friendly team of people that connected on a creative level. Right. I guess when when we started West One, it was it was pre all of the sort of financial crashes that happened, and it was pre kind of you know finance and lawyers getting control of everything. Hmm. Really, it was about us connecting with the creative community that were you know same similar age group to us, similar kind of interests, similar hobbies, similar type of personalities. Right. So you know it's very um, I guess a simple simple uh, connection between those two. Yeah. Those two elements, yeah. But I guess yeah, I mean, it was about people but having the good music, having the music to back that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But so how come um, you wanted to start your own company? Did you, did you get some sort of an entrepreneurial bug or uh, have you seen some other people who inspired you to do your own company? Yeah, so the, so the history of West One is actually, there's, so there's two other partners in West One. So there's three of us now overall. Um, and the two other partners is a guy called Richard Harvey, who is a quite well-known composer. Right. And Tony Pryor, who is a yeah, serial entrepreneur and um, business accountant, finance brain. Right. Uh, and those two individuals are, are quite a bit older than I am. And so they had this concept of West One in its kind of, you know, incubator. And really, we're looking for younger people to come in and to run it day to day and to be the face and to be the driver for it. So really, it was it was born out of the relationship that Tony and Richard had. Right. And before West One, they were producing music for EMI hmm. within their catalogue, which is called KPM. Right. Yeah, I heard about that, I think. Yeah. So, so at one stage, uh, Tony and Richard, under this company umbrella called Fireworks Music, had um, about 120 albums within the KPM catalogue, which were actually, actually produced by them, but it looks like it's KPM. Right. So, yeah, I guess if you look at the history of West One, it's also about the music as well and about the creative process. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, particularly, with, particularly through Richard and his composer relationships. Yeah. So what were some of your early struggles setting up the West One group company? Did it take a while to get the whole thing going, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, the, the early days actually were, 
um, quite interesting because everything was exciting and everything was new. So, it, you know, I guess the, the biggest challenge was always to find who the people were because we hadn't really done it on our own before in that way. So it was really about, you know, trying to find who the right people were that, to talk to um, and to make those connections. And I say, as I say, to get, try and get them to reserve that space for us and to recognize that we were there. And, you know, even at that time, everyone said market saturated, it will never work. There's too many players in the market, um, you know, trying to steer us away from actually getting started. Um, so I guess, you know, chat, chat challenge is very similar to today is market saturation, but way less than it is now. Right. And, and, and also, you know, finding the right people to talk to and finding those right, the right connections mm. and the people that can make the decisions about music. Right. And that continues to be one of the hardest things. Um, I guess the other, the other challenge that as things have moved on and over the years and we've moved outside of just the UK, um, HR and staff and recruitment and getting the right team in place is also very difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. But so you mentioned, you know, getting the, the, the CD on the shelf, getting the right connections. Um, so what was your plan or did you have any strategy to grow your network and, and finally find a place on the shelf, so to speak? Yeah, I mean that's that's that was purely what it was um, was about. I mean that was that was almost everything. It was really about you know make the music as good as it can be, you know make the connections on the client side and try and get that you know get that position and get that recognition and get that space and then from there you know develop the opportunity to to really grow the business. Hmm. Well, was that uh, through networking events or just taking people out for coffee? Oh people. yeah, so like particularly in the UK, it was a lot of because we sort of grew up in the same era. We were a little bit after audio network. I don't know if you know that business. Yeah, yeah. So we we grew up in the sort of you know after after the early days of audio network. So really, we very much focused our attention on TV broadcasters and advertising hmm. because audio network was particularly strong in the production company space. Right. So actually, in terms of market, we sort of found a place within broadcast promos that was really strong for us. And so we just really, I guess, in those early days, really doubled down on where we saw the revenue coming from. Mm. So we really focused quite heavily on you know, those traditional broadcasters, so BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, and Sky. Mm. The other one at the time that was um, you know, a huge financial opportunity for us. Yeah. Um, so, in, and within those companies, there was often these big teams of promo producers. So we would take you know huge teams out for lunch and entertain them, um, and we'd also do an event annually in the UK called Promax. Okay. And so we'd always have a stand at Promax. We would always do parties around Promax. So there were some events that we did around that as well, um, but a lot of it was yeah face to face and entertaining. Um, Wow. But, which I don't think has changed too much in the UK now, although a lot more decisions happen about music are happening at a much higher level. So nowadays, we, we, you know, you're seeing that music choices are made by the lawyers and the finance people who are dictating what catalogues to use. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. Either, yeah, either based on some kind of publishing relationship they have or whether they own their own catalogue now. Right. Or whether they're getting something you know cheap or for free, mm. or if they simply just have a blanket relationship with an individual company, right. you're seeing much more control over music choice from from above. Right, but so because there is a lot of websites um, and also your website, I believe, where you can where you can come and search for music and hopefully find something for your project. So you say that happens less nowadays and is more actually on the other end, so to speak, where it is lawyers and finance people. Uh, I think that still happens, you know, within a certain group, but it's, you almost have to, certainly at the bigger broadcast level, you have to establish the relationships first mm. and then the site becomes accessible to the creative team. Right. So it's, you know, I guess it's, you know, if you look at it in two different ways, it's like bottom up and top down. So you've mm. got the creatives wanting to embrace the music and wanting to use the music because they enjoy it and, they think it's relevant for their creative, hopefully. 
Yeah. And then you've got the top down, which is the lawyers and the finance people doing the overall agreement and working out the terms and working out how much you're going to get paid. Right. So it's kind of, a, you know, it's in between those two worlds. Mm-hmm. And, then, you know, you have obviously you have individuals that are not party to that that can make their own decisions. You know, but that's, you know, generally that's production companies or creative individuals that are making, you know, you know videos for YouTube or whatever it is. Or right. Or, or for video. Yeah. Right. So getting a meeting with like BBC, Channel 4, Sky, those companies you mentioned, how how does one do that? How does one get in, in the, the door, get a foot in the door? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's just, you know, it's about being persistent. I mean, I've, it's been quite interesting because we launched in the US in 2016. Hmm. So I, I'd say to some extent, it feels like we've sort of started again. Yeah. So we're doing things here which sort of hark back to the early days of West One, you know, which is like trying to get a meeting, trying to get meetings with the right people and having those meeting council, those meeting council, uh, you know, various times along the way. Yeah. Um, there's there's some companies that I'm still yet to meet with, and it's we're now in year three, year four. So um, I feel the pain of trying to start something by trying to do that here as well. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> You know, a lot of people, obviously, there's there's brand recognition and there's music recognition and there's a lot of history in, in West One now, thankfully. Um, so we, we are shortcutting a lot of that, but I still experience it, you know, most weeks where we're trying to do something and we're just hitting, you know, hitting that kind of, um, where just another music company reaching out and there's been 250 that week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it goes back to maybe like like you said, like starting a company all over again. Uh, and again, but yeah. we're now unbelievably saturated marketplace. Right. And you know, there's what we've termed the music is music is free disease. Hmm. Um, so you're fighting against you know the supply and demand is completely out of whack, basically. Right. Also, basically, <laughs> the supply is way bigger than the demand. Yeah, I think my view is that supply is definitely bigger than the demand. Right. So it's really, really about what we can do musically <clears throat> that makes us more interesting, makes it unique, makes it different, allows um, someone to open up a different market as a client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that can be as simple as doing, you know, we started doing much more sort of Latin and South American music. Mm-hmm. We have a dedicated label for that called Somos within West One Music Group. Right. And you know, we did that partly for the Latin client base, but also for the American client base as well, because you know we we saw that as a good, you know, a great growth potential within what's happening the Hispanic community in America. Yeah. So you know, there's just lots of those things that we're exploring and trying and pushing for within West One, where we can create product that's unique, because that's one of the big always big questions. It's like what makes you different? What makes you special? Why would I engage with this over another another company or another supplier? Yeah, exactly. But so, you know, because obviously we have Netflix, Apple coming up, um, Amazon, and all these guys uh, not pumping money into, into content, but sh- uh, bringing some increase in, in money into products, right? Like there's more TV series, yeah. uh, films, etc. That's not, is that something you have seen uh, grow grow the market as well? I mean, you're saying it's saturated, but has it also grown? Yeah, I mean, the market has definitely grown. I mean, I did, I did a list of recent Netflix shows that we've worked on um, just over the last couple of days, actually, and, you know, the list is, you know, gets quite long hmm. when you put it all together. Um, so that there is, you know, the explosion of content, particularly out of the States, is huge. And that, that was a big driver of us, you know, launching here as well, was that we always saw America as the great you know, the great content king. Yeah. And that is tra- true now more than ever before. And as you say, I think, you know, now we're into this, this streaming wars era. Hmm. I think that's, that's, that's a real opportunity for all of us. Yeah. Because I, mean, so, I heard someone saying, like, being an actor nowadays has never been easier. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if the same for composers and stuff. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but so talking about, you know, the composer side of it, because uh, I guess you receive a lot of emails from people pitching to you uh, and wanting to work with Wes One. Um, so is there anything 
you can recommend composers do to, well, first of all, uh, get your interest in opening the email and uh, what what a good pitch looks like? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I do receive quite a lot of emails, but I do try and reply to all of them. I don't always have an opportunity to listen, but I do try and acknowledge that I have it and I pass it on to the A&R team. Hmm. So we have an A&R team, we have an email address where everything is aggregated, and then that's all reviewed together uh, with the production team. So mostly based out of the UK, although we have some resource here that looks at demos, but um, generally run through the UK and then it's farmed out and pushed out to individuals depending on their specialist, if the music covers kind of specialist area or if it's interesting for maybe a producer here that's working on something. Mm. So I try and try and go through everything. I think, yeah, I guess the key advice would be um, to have some kind of specialist specialist kind of area again and to make it focused and make it easy for us to go through. So it's quite difficult when you get, you know, sort of 100 tracks and the genres are all over the place. Mm. Um, it's much easier for us to go through something and to see that there's a focus on it and to see that there's, you know, three or four tracks in a very clear, specific style. Um, but we often get that, asked that question of, you know, what, what are you working on? And the problem for us is we're working on 150, 200 things at the same time. Yeah. So it's very different. And our production style is quite different to some other companies in our space. So we generally don't receive music, listen to it, say, oh, that's great, and then put it out. Our, our process is much more hands-on and much more production focused, which I think goes back to the sort of ethos and traditional tradition side of West One. Hmm. So we are we are purely looking for really good composers, really good artists, really good musicians, and then we will help formulate the brief with them. And we work with them to create the final outcome. So so it's really, I guess, the best thing for us is just really displaying the talent and the best, you know, the best of what what someone can do more so than you know here's a million things and what are you looking for or what can i pitch on right um, and i guess yeah that is slightly different i think because there's a lot of companies these days that just you know they send out a brief to 400 people and then 400 people send their tracks in and they either get accepted or rejected yeah for west one it's very different and as i say it's sort of handheld process and we would work with the composer to produce something right yeah um... So if someone just pitch you out of the blue and there's no a brief to work towards, that's something that might get more rejected than otherwise or uh, no, I think that would get more yeah, I think that would get more accepted actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because okay, then you can work with that artist or whatever it is. No, actually this is great. I love this. So either for us it'll either spawn an idea. Mm. Or we'll go, oh yeah, that fits into something that we're doing. Or it will be, oh, we really love this sound and we love what this person is doing. Right. And um, let's let's work with them on this project, which is might be something slightly different, but you know, we can see within what they're doing that they are, you know, mm. yeah, you know, they're they're able to you know cross over and do that other style. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but so another another company, another person I interviewed in this space too. Uh, he was talking about the album trick, so to speak, where if someone, mus musician, is pitching the music, uh, they should do it as an album so it's ready to get um, signed and get out there quickly. Is that something you incorporate too? Yeah, we don't really, yes, sometimes it's very rare that we would go, oh, this is brilliant, let's put it out. Right. You know, it, it does happen, but for I think, again, that goes back to our, the way we produce is, I guess, slightly different. It, because we're, we're always listening to our client base around the world, mm. which is fed through our sales teams, we're often very nuanced in what we want to produce and what the direction is of that product. Mm. So even if someone pitches something that is, from all intents and purposes, a perfect album, we would still potentially tweak it and adjust it and ask them to record different elements or we would change things in our studio, whatever it is. So. Um, it's probably rarer for us to go, oh yeah, this is great, let's put it out. Right. But some other some of the other companies in the same space. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so when looking at the other side of the coin, so to speak, where 
when is your turn to pitch the music to the advertisers, for example, or the production companies? What's your process then? How is that different from when a composer pitches to you? Um, it's pro probably fairly similar, although we have two we have two sides to that. We have what we call sort of reactive pitching, hmm. and we have proactive pitching. So reactive pitching for us is that so we we get hundreds of requests every day with people saying, oh, we're looking for music for an advert, it needs to sound like this, um, it needs to tick these boxes within maybe the structure of the product that they're launching, or it needs to be, you know, or it could be as simple as, oh, it needs to sound like this artist. Hmm. So we receive those, brief, those what we call briefs all the time. So then we put together a collection of songs, could be, you know, 10, 15, 20, depending on what the project is, and then we would pitch it in. Along, along, presumably with you know another 150, 200 different companies that they've reached out to. Yeah. And you know, we're in, we live in the same space as our composers as well. This sort of you know, pitching and hoping. And <laughs> yeah. What happens? So I get, I feel the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and then the other side of it is the proactive side, where we try. You know, maybe this is a good, good way of looking at a parallel of how to approach. Mm. Uh, production music business like us mm. is that we look at what they're doing creatively. Um, let, let's say it's a show, for example, we, we wanted to pitch on. So we would look at past episodes, past seasons of that show, and we would come up with a playlist and a package that we felt reflected what they were doing historically, and maybe you know moved moved it on slightly creatively as well. So then we would come up with pro what we call a proactive pitch, where we would pitch that in and say. Uh, really love your show. I think it's great what you're up to. We've um, obviously been you know, been through it, and we're aware of the music. And, and here is a collection of songs or underscores that we think would be relevant for the next season or the next episode. Mm. Yeah, that's and cool. Then, and then again, you have to do that in the same way, non pushy. Um, you know, you can't really check back in and say, "Did you get it? Right. Did you did you listen to it? Did you like it? You know, what's the feedback?" It's very much, you know, it has to be, you know, even in our, on our side of the coin, it's very much like, here's a playlist, I hope you like it, off you go. Right. So, so you're saying you shouldn't follow up? Well, it's really difficult. Well, we can't, it's difficult for us to push for, for feedback on the clients because they're obviously getting right. hit up hundreds of times as well. So it's probably similar on when, when pitching for production music companies as well as, as a composer, mm. the follow-up. It's you know it's okay if it's a polite follow-up. Yeah. Just checking, just checking you received it. Yeah. But you know sometimes asking for feedback is you know, cha you know it's challenging to get through the volume. Although we always try to, and we always try and give some feedback within within um, our response. Hmm. But yeah, I mean it's difficult because you know same as on our side, our, our clients are busy. Yeah, exactly. And they're they're receiving as you you've got to remember you know they're receiving two three hundred. Music companies emailing them every day. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Uh, you mentioned the pain of pitching and waiting. Is is there something? I mean, you've done it for a long time now. I guess maybe you got harder. But was there a point when it was hard to do it over and over, hoping? Um, yeah, it is. I mean, I think the hardest thing is like the yeah the meeting. You know, trying to get the meetings in. Mm. The, meeting, the meetings get cancelled, and then you know, so you're in this like. And the cycle of uh, am I ever going to meet this company? Are we ever going to get a deal done? You know, yeah, or are we yeah. live in this sort of merry-go-round. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think if somebody on the composer side is probably different. I think if a composer was genuinely really good and they were on our case in a friendly, polite way, I'm sure that we would end up doing something together. Yeah. So it's you know persistence obviously works as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, as long as I, it just needs to be friendly and, you know, and polite and, and, you know, and understanding of everyone's time and what everyone's up to. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, so, because, I mean, usually the whole name of the game is usually relationships, patience, all those sort of things. Um, so how long would you say usually takes for, let's say you've had a meeting and for something to actually come in as paid work for you guys? Um, so it can, well, it depends what it is. So it can be really fast, mm. uh, and, and it can be two years. Just yeah. depends 
And so, like, you know, so a lot of the money we also receive is through societies. Hmm. So, particularly in well, in in the European countries and Australia as well, actually, um, pretty much ninety percent of the money comes through the society network. Right. So that can be a very long cycle. So, if, if, you know, if something's used today on a TV network in France, for example, we might not see that until July twenty twenty. To or 2021, you know, depending on what it is. So, um, mm. you know, it can take that long to get get the cycle. Yeah. Which, you know, and that's hard for composers as well because often we put stuff out and we know it's been successful and we know it's getting used. Mm. You've just got to, there's just such a delay in the revenue streams. Yeah. The society network primarily. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, even, even from a client, even direct licensing a client, uh, we, it's you know sometimes an ad agency takes up to six months to to pay, mm. you know, and, and as an independent, you just have to sort of take that on the chin and keep going. Yeah, I guess it's hardest when you start out when there when you're experiencing your first uh, payment, so to speak, when you have to wait those months, years, maybe. Yeah, I mean we've had composers. So we've in the early days at West One, we had uh, one composer in particular that I can remember where. Um, he did quite a few albums with West One, hmm. and you know the money, he didn't feel the money was coming through fast enough, so he sort of went off and focused on his live music and gigging and doing custom music for advertising. Hmm. And then, because he felt you know the revenue wasn't there and felt a bit disillusioned by production music, and then all of a sudden the money kind of caught up, and then all of a sudden, oof, attention back to production music. Right. And, uh, you know, so sometimes we, it's almost like you have to do a few things, forget about it and wait, wait for it to come back. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that that composer did that. And then he's you know, ever since then, he's understood and realized the value of and potential in production music, really. So. Right. Is there a maybe stupid question, but is there any um, avenue where you earn more money, uh, as in advertising games or films, TV shows, is there any of those that is more valuable than others? Um, I think it's all market specific, like territory specific. Oh yeah? Um, and it's all, yeah, so, you know, for example, in the UK, the majority of the money comes through the society network and the majority of the money is um, generally through broadcasters. So that, that's, you know, why, for example, when I was talking earlier on, a big focus for us at the beginning was promos on TV networks in the UK, because that's where the majority of the money is. Okay. Whereas promos in the US are worth almost nothing. Okay. <laughs> it's quite, there's quite a sort of disparity hmm. from market to market. And, you know, when you look at West One overall, it's really about that blend. So there's some areas where we get really good sync, but not very much back end. There's some areas where we have really great back end performance income, but not much sync. Mm. So it's just all a complete kind of blended picture, really. Mm, I see. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So it's much, it's much more about, the, for us, it's much more about the blend. And you, you can't look at production music as a hits, hits business. Right. No, it's, it's what they call a penny business. And it's where everything adds up as an aggregate. It's, and then you suddenly go, oh, right, great. You know, it might be pages of like ones, but then <laughs> it sort of adds up at the end, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, when composers do want to work with uh, companies like yours, um, is there anything they should be on the lookout for so they don't um, sign with a bad company, so to speak? Is there anything you can tell from uh, websites or stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, there's so many, I mean, it must be an absolute minefield for composers these days. I mean, there's so many different avenues and directions and, all, as you say, like all these different websites and these exclusive, non-exclusive, mm -hmm. sync income, performing income. So again, I mean, that is just a complete and utter minefield. I guess the only thing you can do is, you know, is look for reputable, reputable companies that have been around a decent amount of time um, have a look at what they've got in terms of track record you know, to see where the music's being used mm. maybe talk to some other contributors to see you know to gain you know to sort of gather their experience and what it's like working and what kind of revenue they've been generating 
Um, and then I guess it just comes to, you know, just reading the contract and trying to understand, you know, even though, yeah, you might share in sync income, understanding, oh, can this client actually get any sync income? income? And do they have a position in the market to enable them to do that? Right. So, it's, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. I can see that mm. for a writer mm. these days, you know, like, where do you put the music? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what's the best thing to do yeah exactly yeah. Um, I mean something like, like epidemic sound is another is an example of that as well isn't it say it again yeah. epidemic yeah. sound is a good example of that as well right. is they're sort of suggesting to, to composers oh you know don't join collection societies ah, I didn't you'll do know. better you know you'll do better if you come with us right. direct right so um, yeah it's another one you know it's another okay. yeah I never heard about them actually. Epidemic Sound, you said. Epidemic Sound, so they're Swedish. Oh. Uh, <laughs> originally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So their their kind of angle is it's non society music. So I guess royalty free, effectively. Right, right. So true, true kind of royalty free. But what is the purpose of royalty free? Is does the composer and the publisher not get paid at all? Or what's the what's the trick behind that? Yeah, so it, so the, the relationship between um, the royalty-free label and the composer is a set, effectively a buyout. Mm. So for, for a fee, they're buying out all of the rights in the music. Yeah. So that could be, um, you know, God knows what the fee is. You know, say like five hundred pounds or dollars. Right. Uh, and for that, is it you won't see any more income from that piece of music again. Right. And that let then allows. The company to go on and sell and license that music uh, directly to the client, and there be no um, rights issues that the client has to deal with. Right. You know, for example, if you're uploading a piece of music onto YouTube, YouTube is asking you, "Do you own this music? Mm -hmm. uh, rights acquired? You know, are there, are there any performing right liabilities within this?" Right. So it, it allows you, as the uploader, to say, "No, all rights are cleared, all, all rights are bought out." Right, I see. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. Um, but as a composer too, is it is it better to um, um, sign in perpetuity? What's it called? In perpetuity? In perpetuity? Yeah, in perpetuity. Yeah, in perpetuity. forever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can we say it? But is, is it better to <laughs> go for was, those deals? Yeah, or? you would say life of copyright. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know, whatever it is in statutory terms, in whatever territory you're in, but it's, yeah, life of copyright would be the sort of overarching catch-all for that. Right. Um, yeah, it depends. I mean, some. I mean, that's the only way that West One operates as a business. We are purely life of copyright. Right. Um, but then there's other sort of new entries in the market, which are, you know, those online kind of aggregators of content mm -hmm. where you can put music in and you can take music out. Um, so there, there are other opportunities that are different to, to ours, um, that's for sure. Right. Yes, just to hear late, I guess, and again, you've just got to weigh it up. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that comes back to the difference of West One as well, because we are actively in the production process and we're paying for the recording and we're pulling the music in and the composer into our studios and we're working with them and we're booking the orchestra mm -hmm. and we have the arranger to help and all of that stuff. So we're much more involved in the creative process. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, those platforms are really just, you know, they're not engaged necessarily with the creative process other than just saying yes or no to a song. Right. So generally those ones where they're more transactional and um, where you can, you know, it's not life of copyright mm -hmm. tend to be ones where as the composer you are fully responsible for the creative process in its entirety. You make the choices around music and you upload it to the platform. Right, right. And you know your you as the composer determine if you think it's appropriate for the marketplace. Right. Whereas if you worked with West One, we would help, and together we would try and make sure it was appropriate to the marketplace and try and finesse it in a way that we felt worked. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so it's I, in different models basically. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I also heard that um, usually companies who does those deals, the lifetime deals, so to speak. Um, or it's usually easier to get your music placed if it is a lifetime um, deal because then you don't have to worry about 
changing yeah well, some of, yeah so some of those platforms find it difficult to do licenses in the traditional space mm. because um you know a traditional company or broadcaster as an example won't do a deal with a company where the music's disappearing the whole time yeah yeah um, so, you know, some of our contractual terms on the other side stipulate that we have to leave the music in the deal. Right. So, it's quite difficult if music comes and goes. Mm, yeah, exactly. And, and also for us, because we were investing in the music as well. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's just a very different kind of workflow. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Um, so, talking about rates and, and payments and stuff like that, is it, do you ever get to negotiate the rate for your composer and for your own company or is it usually a set fee from the between, between us and our clients or yes um, yeah, so the, yeah. the company's hiring you basically yeah so we um in most territories other than the uk and australia and through some licensing models in europe as well um, we set our own rates mm, okay. a lot of rates are stipulated by the collecting societies for mechanical licensing Right. Which you know, in a, in effect, is some, I guess the easiest way to think of it is essentially broadcast synchronization. Mm. But it's called mecha- it's a mechanical license, really mechanical reproduction. But for us, yeah, in most places where we're doing our own sync licensing, we set our own rates, market to market, and it completely you know can vary massively between different markets as well. Yeah. You know, so an emerging market obviously is going to be much cheaper from a rate card perspective to an established market like the US or right. somewhere else. Yeah. So how, how do you set your rates, let's say in the US, for example? Do you look at what other companies charge or do you basically... Yeah, charge? you try and, yeah, I think in the early days we try to look at what other people were charging um, and then try to work our pricing around that. Um, we also and try to sim- simplify some of the structures as well. So, you know, even in the US, we try to simplify the rights model, we try to simplify all the rate structures as well. Because over time, most places have become quite complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely a driver, and that's a driver we had in the UK with MCPS as well, was to make it more legible and understandable to a client what they were actually licensing and what they were clearing it for. Right. Um, so there, there, there is examples where you know things, no music terminology can become just complicated, too complicated for a client, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess it comes down to just trying to do something that is market appropriate, mm-hmm. but also you know, but also values the music and values the composers and values the artists as well. So it's you know finding that balance between between the two. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, as we were saying before, clients would most clients would love it if it was cheaper. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but how how do you? Not, if, not all. Not all. Right. <laughs> so how do you, if some client want doesn't want to meet your rate, so to speak, uh, do you have any techniques or uh, systems how you can negotiate them so they can raise? So you can yeah, raise their try, yeah, we were trying to raise a level of awareness around, you know, yeah, as I was saying, you know, around the creative process as well. And, mm. and you yeah, know, not, not justifying, you don't need, really need to justify a position, but, you know, just really just making it apparent, and making it obvious that there's, you know, there's a composer at the end of this as well. He's an, you know, he's an individual or she's an individual um, entity. We're an ind- independent company as well. We're putting a lot of investment into into the music, into our composers, and into what we're doing. Mm. And you know, that's how we value ourselves. And you know, if it's not appropriate, that's okay too. Right. And um, so you just have to. Yeah. Sometimes we have to walk away from things, and you know, so that's okay. You have to be brave as well, and not not always chase everything. No. Pref- yeah, I guess that's the, that's the hardest thing when you start out is to say, is you know, sorry, I have to walk away, you know, because yeah, you're, yeah, you're at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's not just us; it's the, it's the composers as well. So it's yeah, um, it's it's twofold, really. Mm-hmm. So we have to have to somehow like maintain some uh, you know a value proposition, right? But is there, do you um, um, involve the composer into the negotiations, negotiations as well, or is it 
pure, the pure no, estate. Yeah, it's just direct. Yeah, between us and yeah. And how do so you the, negotiate with composers? The was, oh, sorry. The way, the way the deals are structured is that um, between us and the composer is that we get we have control of of that process with the client, so we don't have to go back. Right. Um, unlike a commercial music deal, we don't have to go back for approval. We would make our own judgment. Right. Yeah. That makes that makes it more sense and makes it easier. <laughs> That's the whole idea. I mean, production music is about is you know supposed to be different to commercial music, and yeah. it's supposed to be easy to license, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be pre-cleared, and it's supposed to be simple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So over the years, with, as the new platforms have come in, it's, it has become more complicated. Mm -hmm. But so, do you usually have a standard deal, or actually, my question is, do you, what is a standard deal between a composer and a Company like yours, is yeah, so fifty. They do vary um, company to company. Mm. Um, within West One uh, Group as a whole, we have different labels, and some other labels have a different deal structure. Um, but we don't negotiate. So, like for example, on West One, we don't negotiate album by album. But otherwise, it'd be too much of a nightmare. Mm. And 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 also, it, we need to respect composers before as well. So. You know, we wouldn't, you know, negotiate a better deal for a composer tomorrow that did something, you know, that was then what we didn't offer somebody else as well. Right. So, it's a, it's, I guess it's twofold. It's like making sure we have a principled and, you know, sense checked deal structure that we can stand behind and then don't vary it too, you know, too much because it that, that also can be disruptive and upset other writers that have written for us before. As well, so it's just, yeah, I guess trying to find a balance between that. Mm. Most of the negotiation side for us would be um, what joint marketing initiatives we can do together. What kind of marketing spend we would put to, put behind it in addition to the production costs and what production costs we're paying for um, up front as well. Um, and you know, is there some kind of advance payment? if the composer is doing a lot of stuff um, in their own facility, in their own studio. Right. So those are, those are some of the areas where it's more of a discussion, more of a process together, mm. but the broad terms we try and keep quite solid, basically. Right, that makes sense. But they're all different. I mean, every label is different within those as well. Right, yeah. <laughs> So, 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 you know, some people have no recoupment, some people have recoupment, some people pay sync, some mm. people don't pay sync, some people pay mechanicals, some people don't. Right. So, it's, you know, every, everyone is slightly different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the most common one I've seen, maybe that's wrong or not, um, but it's usually, isn't it like usually 50 50 sync split? No, is it? The, yeah, sync fee split and then royalty 100% to the artist composer. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's a sort of yeah very traditional version of the deal. Yeah, right. in its purest form. Right. Um, those those deals are varied a little bit oh, these okay, days. Yeah. yeah, it tends to be you know like yeah share of fifty fifty of sync and then the writer gets the writer's share of performance mm. and the publisher gets the publisher's share of performance. Right, right. That's interesting. Uh, then, there's a, then there's a blend within that around, you know, is there an advance and is that recouped against the right. synchronization and, you know, what are the recording costs and how are they handled? Are they recouped and not recouped? Right. I mean, is that easier today? Because I guess most of the music is sort of in-house, as in it all takes place in one studio, uh, one, one or two guys who does it, or is that not the case maybe? No, yeah, that's not the case. Yeah, no. so um, yeah, so West One is about I think there's about ten, eleven people in the production team. Wow, okay. And they um, we have studios in London. We have studios now in LA, mm. and um, so those those two teams are effectively are control of most of the production output. But all of the composers are freelance. Right. And throughout the history of West One, I think our royalty, last royalty distribution was to about a thousand composers. Wow. So that's yeah. kind of, yeah, so it's a constantly kind of growing um, team of an ecosystem of talent. Yeah, yeah. And like, for example, this week, pretty much, 
I guess half of the production team are in Prague doing orchestral recordings. Mm. So they're doing a whole week of strings and brass on various different projects. Right. So, for example, we're doing a Thai pop album, which was actually produced in LA, recorded in Thailand. Yeah. And the strings are being recorded in Prague. <laughs> and so Chris, Chris Brown, who's our producer from here, is out there to do that. So he's adding the strings onto that album. And that's our decision, saying to the composer, you know, we think we should add live strings to this. We think it would add, you know, another layer of um, kind of, you know, I guess, slickness to the overall project. So we want to add the strings, so we'll go and do it. Um, we're doing an Olympics, like a, a Japanese Olympics album for a client. Oh, cool. Um, so they wanted, they sort of ordered a, this a, this album, which we are doing right. together with a few different composers from Japan. And so, and that's going to become a Westworld music album as well. And so we're doing the taikos in Tokyo, and then we're doing the strings in again on these sessions in Prague. Yeah. Um, and there's about you know that's just two examples, and there's probably about seven or eight projects we're doing within the space of this week. Mm. That's really really cool. But I don't think many, not many, because it's so disparate in terms of the output now. I don't think many of the composers are actually going to those sessions because some of them, as I say, live in Japan or Thailand or here mm. in the US. So. Um, you know, sometimes they do. They do go. It just depends on whether they, you know, they they're around or available or you know. Yeah, but do you take those um, decisions after you have got the gig, or is that something you can also do just to get a project to spend more money, or you should do it? Oh uh, yes, so, yeah. So well, expect, yeah. I mean, that's the whole production music game: is you make it, and then you sell it. Generally, right. Yeah. yeah, so we're we're making it, um, as I say, we're just making it as good as we can make it. So you know, when something when we work through something with a composer, if we feel it needs something added, mm. you know, we're the ones who will take on that responsibility and go and add it. Right. So we wouldn't say to a composer, "You go and record some strings. See you later." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would say, "Oh, we got we got our string. You know, we got our next string session coming up. We'd love to add that in, and then we have we do the arrangement on it." sort it all out and then book the musicians and do it all. Right. That makes sense then. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, maybe this is a random question, but you know when you watch a Netflix show, maybe Amazon Prime show as well, nowadays you can skip the intro of the, the TV show. Or yeah, yeah. Skip does, the theme. Yeah, does, does that affect the, the, the royalty composers that you guys earn? Um, I don't think it does. Um, what is difficult with those services is there is a bit of a lack of transparency ah. around uh, nuances like that. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, there is, you know, there, those deals now with the societies are generally on a par with, with, with broadcasters or with smaller, particularly with smaller commercial broadcasters. So there is enough revenue in the pot, it's just how that is divvied up and how, is that, how that's shared on a usage-by-usage usage basis. Right. Um, it's a little less than 100% transparent. So yeah, when something's skipped, like an intro, I think it's still recognized because that show is watched and it's within the cue sheet. Right. Uh, so I would believe that if it's, you know, the distributions are generally cue sheet driven and if that song is in the cue sheet and the show is performed, then it would be factored in. Right. Yeah, because I always wonder that since they brought it out, it's like, hmm, is this bad or not? <laughs> yeah, I think it's okay. I think okay. It's, I think it's okay. I'll look into that as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. difficult sometimes. The, 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 yeah, there's the less, especially with the big, the fangs or whatever they're called, you know, um, the big tech. Right. Slightly less transparency around how the deals work. Oh, okay. Unfortunately. Right. Well, so you say they operate different than, let's say, a broadcaster, than like BBC? Yeah, it's just a bit more transparency and a bit more history. And, ah, okay. um, there's a much more, you know, obviously, in terms of established principles around licensing and distribution, right. which, are, which are slightly different in this newer world of streaming services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the streaming services are pretty much on there. You know, they're just, they've just concluded almost their second licenses. So it's... You know, still relatively early days in terms of even even getting these licenses, yeah, these services licensed. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. 
Um, so just coming actually to my last question here. Um, do you have a favorite failure that set up set you up for later success in the in the music industry or in or in life in general? Um, that's a good question. I need to think about that one. <laughs> that's uh, <fine. laughs> yeah, I mean, probably. Fa I mean, probably failing all the time in what we're producing. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a hard question. I'm not sure. That's okay. The answer to that one. <laughs> that's right, man. <laughs> probably failing all the time. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just, just not really thinking about it and just keeping going. So probably, uh, probably constant failures. Right, right. That yeah. makes sense actually. I mean, yeah, I guess you need to. I mean, the stuff that we've done where we've done oh, no, it doesn't hasn't quite worked and we've given up on it. But I guess it ten, tends to be um, music related more than anything else. Right. Was there anything in the beginning of starting was one where you thought, oh, this is how it works, but it turned out, oh, this doesn't work at all actually. Um, not I can think of. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's making it sound like it's really, really good, but I'm sure there must be something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe come to you later in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's cool. I mean, discipline myself to be positive the whole time, so I have no idea. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, but can you let the listeners or watchers uh, know where they can find more about you and West One before we wrap up? Yeah, so um, yeah, so the best things to do if you're a composer and you want to submit stuff, um, so visit the website, have a listen through the different labels. So e each label has a different personality. Each label has a different person uh, that runs the production and is the production manager mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. labels. So they have they have their own ethos and they have their own production style, and they have their own individual that looks after it. So you know, go through that within West One and understand how that works, um, and then reach out to us. And there is, there is an A and R email address, which is a and r at westonemusic.com, and I think that's accessible via the website as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, link to the uh, website below, I guess. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so maybe. <laughs> yeah. maybe. Um, yeah, so go, you know, go to the website, do some research, have a look at us. Feel free to email the A and R email address, and then I think most of us within the team are listed on the website, and we're also um, on LinkedIn and stuff as well. So you know, feel free to research what we've all been doing and all of that kind of good stuff. Cool. But yeah, we, we were, you know, as I say, we were an open. Kind of company we have offices in about 12 different locations so it's not just london and um, la there's also you know new york there's dublin there's paris there's germany there's thailand uh, there's australia so there's um, you know there's lots of different touch points depending on where the view you know the viewers are for this as well so mm -hmm. yeah so feel free to get in touch awesome always looking for great music great yeah That's exactly what, <laughs> what yeah yeah Awesome, Edwin. Yeah, thanks again for coming on and it was awesome talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Edwin, for coming on to the podcast. It was awesome talking to you and hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Before you go, leave a like, subscribe, download the free guide, all that sort of things. Leave a comment where your thoughts are, if you have any questions. Um, but that's it for this week. I'll see you guys soon.